I, I was led uh, about midweek to, uh, and clearly by the Spirit, uh, to, to move us from Mark uh, and really talk about the significance of motherhood. The one verse that we're going to anchor in this morning is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll also be uh, in a few verses in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, um, and you know, just what a, a great day this is, but as Heather mentioned, also recognize that this can be a, a challenging day for many of us for a variety of reasons, um, and there certainly is uh, the joy uh, that uh, we're able to experience, um, those of us that uh, have uh, our mothers with us still and have our children, but there's also uh, a fair amount of, of hurt. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, um, and the events that have happened recently, current events, um, I do I want to talk about the significance of motherhood and uh, where we are. Uh, I'm not so concerned where we are as a society, but certainly uh, as a church, we need to be thinking rightly about uh, the role of women, uh, the, the beauty of women, uh, women being co-heirs of uh, the grace of God, and uh, children being a blessing from God, but also being uh, nurtured through their mothers. And so, with that being said, I do want to say Happy Mother's Day. And this might actually be the last year we celebrate this day in America. I mean, as soon as next year, we could find this holiday being retitled Happy Birthing Person's Day. Um, you know, the assault on uh, women is uh, fast and furious these days. And, you know, the God uh, of the Bible and the Christian church values and respects women. We find that throughout Scripture. And the world and our society at large does not. In fact, I would go so far to say that the secular society at large hates women. Now, women are being marginalized and attacked in ways that just even 10 years ago would seem unimaginable. And why is this? Well, because Satan is the ruler of this world and Satan hates God. And the attacks that we are seeing on women... And women as mothers are actually attacks on God himself and his design for the created order. And I will just, I'm just going to point out three things that have just happened recently that should give us all pause. Uh, I am no technological genius by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but I do know what an emoji is. And I do know that uh, Apple has come out with a pregnant person emoji. A pregnant person person. You know, well, what type of person can get pregnant? Well, there's only one. A woman. Um, why? Why would Apple come out with a pregnant person emoji? And if you've actually seen the emoji, it's like you can't help but just like I snort laugh the first time. It's just my instinct. Like this is such a joke. I mean, this is so stupid. This is so foolish. The second thing we've seen over the past few weeks and months, a man was deemed the NCAA champion of a women's swimming event. A man. He was, he was a man. He swam for the men's team two to three years ago. He's now declaring that he's a woman. He's being allowed to swim and compete against women, and he was declared the champion of the women's event. And the person, I've said this before, but and the person who is set to be our newest Supreme Court Justice was unwilling to define and defend what a woman is, even though she happens to be a woman herself. In fact, the one of the only reasons she was chosen, I'm not saying it's the only reason, but one of the things that the administration made very clear, they were looking for a woman. That was one of the intersections that they wanted to have crossed. It was going to be a woman. So even though she's a woman herself, and she is the mother of two daughters. The 
Folks, the forces of evil are all around us. And for those outside of Christ, this statement could not be more accurate. We have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Insinity. Anybody ever hear that word before? Insinity? Probably not, because it's a word I just made up. And why not? Everybody's making up stuff these days, so I'm just going to join in the parade. Okay? So here's my definition of insanity. It's a combination of insane and sin. You know, our society is so beholden to sin, so enslaved to it, that the ideas of motherhood and the sanctity of life have become bywords and phrases of disgust to a significant portion of our population, including the President of the United States. <coughs> this week, someone within the office of the Supreme Court leaked to the press the fact that the court was on the precipice of overturning Roe versus Wade. Probably the most unjust uh, ruling that's ever been handed down from the Supreme Court. And when the president was asked about this potentially historic ruling, listen to what he said. The president said, and I quote, and think what Roe says. Roe says what all basic mainstream religions have historically concluded. That the right, that the existence of a human life and being is a question. Is it at the moment of conception? Is it six months? Is it six weeks? Is it quickening like Aquinas argued? End quote. Well, why am I bringing the president into this? And the reason I'm bringing the president is because he attempted to use theology as a defense for murder. And there is no way as a pastor of a church that I will allow that to go unchecked. Absolutely not. But that is not the half of it. Additionally, the president said the following. He said, uh, I'm, just, I'm quoting you word for word. It's a little hard to, sometimes it's hard to understand our president. But the, so there's, you know, there's a portion in here that uh, is very clear. I mean, so the idea that we're going to make a judgment that is going to say, no one can make the judgment to choose to abort a child based upon a decision by the Supreme Court, I think goes way overboard. Now, the key words are those where he describes the decision to have an abortion as the judgment to choose to abort a child. Now, what we see here is the case of a major American pol politician accidentally speaking the truth. Because that's exactly what abortion is. Abortion is the horrific action of dissolving or disemboweling or dissecting a living child. And this is exactly what the, the pro-choice, pro-abortion movement tries to say abortion is not. They try in every way possible to say that abortion is it's not an abortion of a child. It's not the abortion of a baby. But that's exactly what abortion is. It is the murder of the most vulnerable among us, done within the confines of a woman's womb, a place where a child should be the most protected. In contrast to this, some of us had an opportunity to walk yesterday in downtown Woodstock, uh, the Hope Center, uh, the Walk for Life. It was just a, a great, it was a great time. Just great. They had little signs along the way quoting scripture, the affirmation uh, of life, uh, the value not only of women but babies, the beauty of children. You know, the timing of this leak is so interesting. Because it's occurred just day be days before Mother's Day. I don't think any stretch of the imagination, whoever leaked this, I don't think that was, this was in their mind. They were, they were seeking to do this. But the timing is just, in my mind, is amazing. I mean, sin nature, the sin nature of man is on full display. 
You know, for days, people have expressed outrage over the fact that the federal government might no longer sanction the murder of preborn children. And today, some of those same people will attempt to pay lip service to the day known as Mother's Day. Well, the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Al Mohler, made this statement on Friday. We need to recognize that most people think of Mother's Day as something of a cultural obligation. And furthermore, their natural response is one of at least temporary sentimentality. That is to say, everyone feels warm feelings towards mom on Mother's Day. Everyone feels the need to say something to mom on Mother's Day. There's an entire industry of Mother's Day cards, flowers, gifts, and all the rest. I would not speak against the holiday. I wouldn't advise doing that. I'm not even speaking against the sentimentality. I'm just going to say that as Christians looking at an event like this, we need to recognize that it is crying out a certain kind of moral knowledge. It is crying out a certain understanding that goes far deeper than sentimentality. End quote. Mother's Day brings forth a certain kind of moral knowledge. And that is what I want us as Christians to focus on this morning, the moral knowledge that motherhood brings forth. As human beings, we are all moral agents who make moral choices and are able to di differentiate between right and wrong. And the Bible contains God's revealed moral will. It contains his holy and perfect word. And if we want to know right from wrong and what is morally acceptable to God, we turn to the Bible. It's our source of divine, absolute truth. And over the next few minutes, I'd like us to contemplate and seek out the morally correct answers to the following questions. What is a woman and why did God create woman? Who creates a child and when does life begin? What role do mothers play in God's plan of redemption and restoration? And finally, how is the gospel unveiled in and through motherhood? The morally correct answers to these questions comes from the word of God. So let's turn there. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 16, just the first part of verse 16, Genesis chapter 3. So, uh, where are we? We're in the, the garden. Uh, Adam and Eve have sinned. Uh, God has tracked down Adam and Eve in the, uh, in the garden, and, uh, as, as well as the serpent. He's spoken to the serpent already. Now he's speaking to the woman. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman, he said... I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. So question number one, what is a woman and why did God create woman? I want you to notice three things from this verse. Who did God speak to? He spoke to the woman. He spoke to the woman. Didn't speak to the man, spoke to the woman. There was no other person there. He spoke to the woman. God declared a blessing that through the woman, he would continue the human race and that the woman would be the one who brings forth children. And the third thing, God declared a consequence, pain in childbearing. Why? Forgiveness is a commitment by God but it does not mean the elimination of all consequences of sin. Sin brings forth suffering. You've heard me talk about this before. Sin brings forth suffering. And I will say this, that there are, I would say, in my estimation, based on the number of uh, babies that have been estimated to be aborted, tens of millions, there's probably upwards of a million or two women in this country right now who have experienced, uh, undergone abortion. And the forgiveness of God in and through Jesus Christ, they are not outside of that. 
Christ died for all of our sins. And if any woman or man who's encouraged a woman to seek an abortion, through repentance and belief in God, can be restored. But yet, there's still always going to be that consequence, that pain that will never leave. And so God declared a consequence, pain and childbearing. So what is a woman? Well, let's turn back to Genesis chapter 2, which details for us the creation of man and woman. Genesis chapter 1 details for us the entirety of creation. Gives us a really big overview. Chapter 2 details for us with greater specificity the creation of man and woman. So Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain in the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Once again, I want you to notice three things. God formed and created the man first. That's what he decided to do. That's how he created the man first. And there's a significance in that. I'm not going to go into that significance, but that's what, this, that's what the text tells us. God formed the man from the dust. And the man became a living creature. Why? Because God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He formed his body, but without the breath of life, just the body. Now, continuing in Genesis chapter 2, looking at verses 18 through 24. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I want you to notice just a couple things here. God did not intend for man to live and rule alone. He needed another type of human helper. The only thing that was not good in all of creation in the garden was that Adam was alone. Man, that's not the way man was designed, to rule on his own. God formed and created the woman from the man. Created the man from the dust, created the woman from the man. And once the woman is created, the institution of marriage is ordained by God. Where do we get who determines what marriage is? God. Once the woman is created, the institution of marriage is ordained by God, and moral sexual behavior is dis defined. The only type of moral sexual behavior is that between a man and a woman who are married. That's it. Every other act of sexual behavior is immoral. 
and the purpose of the gender differences is understood. Gender, sexuality, and marriage are all linked. Why do we find ourselves in the position we find ourselves in today? Because there was an attack decades ago on sexuality, the uh, ability or desire to use one's body as a person sees fit, then the attack on marriage. And what do we have today? We have all types of brokenness. And look at the people that we've become. We live in this country. It is a disposable society. Uh, my dishwasher is five years old. It's not working. I'm just going to throw it out and get a new one. My car's got a couple of years on it. Nope, I'm just going to trade it and get a new one. Oh. My girlfriend is pregnant. Let's just dispose of, I'm not going to call it a child, but let's just dispose of it. Oh, I don't like the person I'm married to anymore. Dispose of him, dispose of her, find myself a new one. Gender, sexuality, and marriage are all linked. They cannot be unlinked, according to the Word of God. They are all tied together. We go back. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, co-equals. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. There's purpose in procreation. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Male and female, he created them. There's no other genders. There's two. That's it. We can, people can say whatever they want, pretend whatever they want to pretend. And I understand it. I mean, people are hurting. People are struggling. But we can't let people live in a world of fairy tales. Because, why? Because the end is so significant. He created them in his image, is what it says. In his image. Why? Ultimately, to enjoy and reflect his glory. And it was very good. This is how God intended us to live. This is very good. This is not, the rules and regulations of God are not restrictive. They are freeing. I've used this analogy before, but it's like a train on a train track. When the train is on the train track, it can go. But as soon as it looks out to the hills and the mountains and says, oh, you know what, I want to go four-wheeling, that's not so much. When we walk according to the word of God, that's when we find the most freedom. That's when we find the most joy. That's when we 
we are fulfilled and the glory of God is experienced and revealed in and through us. Listen to this statement from the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. It's actually from a statement called the Nashville Statement. I'd encourage you to look it up if you've never read this statement before, the Nashville Statement. statement. And this is the preamble to the Nashville Statement, at least part of the preamble. As Western culture has become increasingly post-Christian, it has embarked upon a massive revision of what it means to be a human being. By and large, the spirit of our age no longer discerns or delights in the beauty of God's design for human life. Many deny that God created human beings for his glory and that his good purposes for us include our personal and physical design as male and female. It is common to think that human identity as male and female is not part of God's beautiful plan, but is rather an expression of an individual's autonomous preferences. Autonomous meaning self-ruling or self-governing. Basically what they're saying here is, hey, what we're seeing is people just determine, you know what? I was born a male. Scientifically, biologically, anatomically, I'm a male. But I don't want to be a male anymore because it's my life, my body, I'm going to do what I want. The pathway to full and lasting joy through God's good design for his creatures is thus replaced by the path of short-sighted alternatives that sooner or later ruin human life and dishonor God, end quote. That just reminds me of the end of the book of Judges. <laughs> and every... Man did what was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. A woman is a human being created in the image of God, made to glorify God through the unique physical and emotional gifts she has been given by God. Based on the scripture, that's how I would one Sentence, simple statement. A woman is a human being created in the image of God, made to glorify God through the unique physical and emotional gifts she has been given by God. Only women can be mothers. And for some, for some women, God has chosen them to become mothers. For others, God has chosen women and gifted them to live as devoted helpers and co-heirs of salvation alongside their husbands. Not every woman has been gifted and called to be a, a, a mother. But in marriage, some women are gifted and called to live as devoted helpers and co-heirs of salvation alongside their husbands. And society hates that. And for still others, God has chosen and gifted them to live a life of singleness, completely devoted to God. And yet, society just can't attack women enough. And they replace it, replace the goals and the design and the desire that God has for women and replace it with things that are just, you know, the enemy is just so vicious. So question number two, who creates children and when does life begin? You know, one of the most disturbing things about what the president said was the idea that all mainstream religions have concluded the same thing. The moment a life begins is in question. That is patently false. Now, whether the president spoke this lie intentionally or out of ignorance really doesn't matter. What matters is that we understand that that statement is 100% false. True Christians hold to the Bible as inerrant, without error, and infallible, incapable of being wrong. Why? Because the Bible is God's spoken word, his spoken direction and commandment to us. 
And the words of the Bible are the words of our God, divinely inspired and given to us through the superintended hands of men. The president is in error because he neither knows the scriptures nor the power of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Who creates children? Who brings forth human life? God does. In my mind, in my eyes, Psalm 139, absolutely the definitive, the go-to Scripture. Psalm 139. I'm going to read verses 13 to 16. It's a Psalm of David. Psalm 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Translation, you knew me before I even was. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. When does life begin? Well, many Christians argue that it begins at conception, and I would say that's partially correct. If physical life begins at conception, and it's the moment that we become aware our life has been created. We live in a day and age where uh, there are certain types of images that can even show us that. But life is determined before conception. Life is determined by God. That's what that scripture says. It, one more verse, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Life is created by God. How? He's chosen to use men and women as the vessels to bring forth that life. But physical life begins at conception. Life, you and I, God knew us before we were even conceived. Your body is not your own. And a preborn baby is not a choice. A preborn baby is a human being created by God in his image. To be pro choice is to be anti God. There is no way, based on scripture, that someone can claim to be a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, and also claim to be pro choice. Now, I am not saying that there are, especially when it comes down to our lives, when it gets really real, there are a lot of complications, a lot of things that we've got to think through and struggles and hurts, and I understand all that. <coughs> but at the end of the day, this is what Scripture says, and we are to be a people that promote and choose life and why we should do that. I'm, I'll reflect on that in a few moments. But you cannot be, you can't, you cannot be a disciple of Christ and be someone who is open to the idea of murdering children. Question number three, what role do mothers play in God's plan of redemption and restoration? Turn with me, if you would, to the New Testament. Um, we're going to look at Titus 
chapter 2. I'm going to read a couple verses, and then we're going to look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 as well. Uh, Paul writing here, he's instructing Titus and Timothy on proper church order and roles. And what is the church? It's a body of believers who gather regularly to be encouraged and, and instructed in discipleship. It's a training ground for learning to exercise self-control. The church is the body of Christ who is the head and the ruler of the body. And every part of the body has a purpose and role to fulfill, all for the glory of God. And this is what Paul speaks about. First in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Well, what accords with sound doctrine? Everything that follows that verse. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and in love and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Well, what's good? And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. I was speaking directly to Titus here. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. All the people of God have a specific role to play and job to do. If you're a member of this church, you are valued, you are called, you are equipped, you have a significant role to play in terms of growing in Christ-likeness and glorifying God. Being a member of a church is not just about coming on Sundays. Coming on Sundays, where we unfold the Word, should quicken us and sharpen us and grow us. But being a member of a church is being member of being a part of a body that's held together for the purpose of loving other people and loving God. Now turn to 1 Timothy. It's uh, going to be to your left a couple pages. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. And, and you'll notice, you know, some of these verses, I mean, oh, the world just hates, hates what God has to say about especially the roles of women. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse starting in verse 8. Once again, same thing. He, Paul writing to Timothy now, explaining the, imper, the purpose of proper church order and roles. 1 Timothy chapter 2, Starting in verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Okay, there's a lot here. I want to focus on those last few verses. That is what is pertinent to the topic this morning. Verses 13 to 15. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. What is God telling us through the Apostle Paul? Can women actually be saved through childbearing? Are all mothers going to heaven? Is there, is there an alternative way to being saved that is, is hidden here that m many people don't know about? That Pastor Mike has never, like, Pastor Mike, you've never shared this before? There's like an alter alternative? Like, 
All we have to do is have a child and we're good? Well, I'm in agreement with John MacArthur's exegesis of these verses. He says, quote, The context helps our understanding. Verse 14 speaks of women being in sin and verse 15 of women being saved. Paul was making clever use of the literary device of contrast. Paul's not contradicting the New Testament teaching that salvation is by faith alone. And the future tense and the use of the plural pronoun they indicate he was not referring to Eve. Paul is teaching that although a woman precipitated the fall, specifically Eve, women are preserved from that stigma through childbearing. A woman led the human race into sin, yet women benefit humankind by replenishing it. Beyond that, they have the opportunity to lead the race to godliness through their influence on their children. Far from being second-class citizens, women have the primary responsibility for rearing godly children. A mother's virtue has a profound impact on the life of her children. For women who are called to motherhood, in order to fulfill their calling to raise a godly seed, they must continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. To raise godly children, a woman must be godly herself. End quote. Do you now see the invaluable role that mothers play in God's plan of redemption and restoration? In his podcast on Friday, Al Mohler also made this extremely obvious but extremely powerful statement. Every single one of us developed our very first human relationship with a mother. Every single one of us. There is no exception throughout human history other than Adam and Eve themselves. Other than Adam and Eve, every single one of us, all of their successors, all of their heirs, all of Adam's race share in common that we emerged from a womb. And that means our very first relationship was within the nurturing womb of a mother. Finally, question number four. How is the gospel unveiled in and through motherhood? I turn back to Genesis chapter 3, if you may. Or if you will, I should say. Let's look at verses 20 through 21 and chapter 4, verse 1. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam... And for his wife, garments of skins, and clothed them. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. That's the beginning of verse 2. So how is the gospel unveiled in and through motherhood? Well, the gospel is a message about God, who is our holy, loving creator. And God brought forth physical life through Eve. Adam and Eve did not conceive children apart from God. And so it is today. They were the instruments that God used to bring forth life. But God doesn't need us to bring forth human life. God is the creator of all things. He can create a human being out of dirt, out of a bone. He can evil, even if you're familiar with Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 36. There are dead bones scattered across a field. And right in front of Ezekiel, God puts those bones together, puts Ligaments on those bones, puts muscle on those bones, puts skin on those bones, and breathes life. A field of dead people, not even just bones. God doesn't need us. He chooses us. He chooses to work in and through us. 
And what a privilege it is. It is absolutely amazing to see a baby develop, to see a baby be born, to see a baby become a child and a child become an adult, and to be part of that process. What a blessing. The gospel is also a message about man, how we are rebellious, sinful, and how we stand condemned. But God brings forth life, and sin brings forth death. Why will we die a physical death? Because we are sinners who have sinned. We've forgiven in Christ, but sin has consequence. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. That's from Psalm of David. And David is not speaking of the physical act of procreation being sinful, although sometimes it is when done outside the union of marriage. He is speaking about his mother's sin nature and the need for all of us to be born again. So, Adam and Eve, they brought forth children. And you see the first child that was brought forth, Cain. The gospel is a message about Jesus Christ, that he is God incarnate and our living, loving Savior. Look again at verse 21 of chapter 3. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. The sacrificial system begins here. Garments of skin. Not skins of plants. Skins of animals. That had to be sacrificed. So the sacrificial system begins here. And it ends with Jesus Christ. Who is our perfectly holy penal substitute. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. Indeed under the law almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins. And finally, the gospel is a message that must be received and responded to. Look at chapter 4, verse 1, and I'm also going to turn your attention to chapter 4, verse 25. Chapter 4, verse 1 again. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Verse 25 of chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. I would argue that Adam and Eve repented of their sins, believed God, and were saved. Now, God gave them both the desire and the ability to have children, and uh, we know that more than likely they were the ones that taught Cain and Abel how to properly worship and relate to God. You remember, Abel, what did he bring? He brought the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice and the fat portions and you can read it there in Genesis chapter 4 and God received his offering but Cain's offering an offering of the ground and God did not accept that offering and he said to Cain if you do well won't you be accepted meaning repent and turn do what you're commanded to do do what you're called to do So I believe that Adam and Eve taught Cain and Abel about the sacrificial system. And by grace through faith, God gave them Seth to begin a lineage that brought forth Jesus Christ and the redemption and restoration of mankind from the curse of sin that they themselves had initiated. So, in conclusion... I would urge us to realize as Christians, it's not enough to say that abortion is a sin. It is, and we must put even the idea of it away, and we must make it known that it is a sin. 
And we must urge others to put the idea of it even away. But we need to take the message further into completion. You know, motherhood and children are both gifts from God. Good gifts that we should embrace and nurture and cherish because mother and children are people. And men, men of the church, we need to take the lead on this. We need to be the ones that seek to love and to cherish and to teach and to respect and to guide women, children. We need to be loving leaders, the loving leaders that we have been called to be. And there are several young ladies out in the audience here this morning. If God calls you to be married, The man that you marry needs to meet one qualification. I mean, if you want him to be good looking and funny and rich and all that, I mean, I, okay, I'm not, whatever, that's fine. But one qualification. Here's what the man, if God calls you to marry, the one qualification that that man needs absolutely, that you can, if, if you sacrifice this, if you give any, any leeway to this one attribute, you will find yourself in some undue suffering. Well, what is it? That man, you need to be absolutely sure that that man has repented of his sins and believed on Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And how will you know that? How will you know? Because that man, he will love you. He will love the church. He will love God's word. He will love all the things that Jesus Christ himself loves. <coughs> if you pray for a man like that, and you're calling to be married, God will deliver that man, and you hold tight to that man. Because that man will lead you by the Spirit in all things concerning life and godliness. But men, we need to be training up our men because there's other young men in, in this audience. And so men, you need, young men, you need to be that man. You need to be pursuing Christ. And us older men, we need to be teaching and leading and loving. And the only way that happens is for us to draw nearer to God to, as the scripture says, to act like men. And for the church, we need, we need to seek to meet needs. Because if people are going to bring forth life, and people will bring forth life in sin, so people will bring forth life not anticipating to bring forth life, Bring forth life, not being married. What do we need to be? We need to be people that are willing to go out and support and pray for and uh, value life. We need to be people that are willing to uh, be involved in foster care, adoption, contributing to ministries that support life. We need to be the light. We need to be the people that are bringing hope to the world. Because blessing flows from the knowing and 
the doing of God's word. None of us are exempt from what we're called to do. And finally, I'll just say this. The glory of God is revealed through the lives of mothers and of children. We all have a part to play in this. The, the world is broken. People are hurting. People are lost. This is not a time for us to curl up in some sort of cocoon, to hide away. This is a time for us to go out, and it may cost us. But this is what we're called to do. One life. Is one life worth that? If you have the ability to impact one life, to change somebody's eternity, would it be worth it? And the beautiful thing is, we're not called to do this alone. We're not doing it by our power. We're not doing it by our wisdom. <coughs> We've got God with us. We've got God with us. Let us bring forth the hope and the glory of God through rejoicing in mothers, women, life. Amen. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your word, which is absolute truth. Lord, we would, be, we would be hopeless. We would be lost without it. Lord, I, I know there are some, some great things that have been spoken here uh, this morning through your word, some tough things that have been spoken. Uh, Lord, I just pray for you know our hearts, you know our needs. I just pray that we would just, your love for us would just overwhelm us. And we would pour out that love uh, to those uh, that are in need of it uh, for their good and for your glory. Uh, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We pray all this in the precious and the mighty and the supreme name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good day and God bless.